This is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror series. You're listening to the 80 Slasher Librarian's audiobook presentation of Twice Burned. Keep it scary out there. Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Twice Burned, by David Bergantino. Chapter 3 The rest of the school day went by without further incident. Colleen passed Vicky in the hall several times, but pretended the other girl didn't exist. She knew that if they locked eyes for even a moment, Vicky would try to bait her again. Her efforts were successful. Soon school was over and Colleen had made it unscathed to the Springwood Public Library to work on her history report. Normally, Colleen enjoyed going to the public library. The place had seemed ancient even when she had been a small girl. All the bookshelves were made of old mahogany, and the few walls not hidden by books were paneled in the same dark wood. Mounted on the walls were ornate light fixtures that had been converted from gas lamps and oil paintings of Springwood's founding fathers. The database terminals, which had only recently replaced the antiquated card file system, and the barcode readers used to check out books were, along with the touchtone phones, the only signs of truly modern technology. But today, Colleen found herself unable to concentrate on her work. At first, she thought it was due to her run-in with Vicky, but that wasn't it at all. It was her dream. The image of being burned alive atop a pile of books kept popping into her mind. At the moment, she was surrounded by books, and that made her feel unsafe. Not even the presence of Kirk and his cousin Lance, both of whom worked at the library, made her feel any safer. At least Vicky was nowhere to be seen, but then again, Tish was here, sitting two tables down from Colleen, and where there was Tish, Vicky might not be far away. Actually, when Vicky wasn't influencing her, Tish could be very sweet, and under other circumstances, Colleen thought that the two of them could have been friends. But mild-mannered, homely Tish held Vicky in awe. Sadly, Colleen understood. Tish was not a happy girl, and most of it stemmed, according to the prevailing rumors, from troubles at home. She apparently had an abusive father and a mother unable or unwilling to protect herself or her daughters from his angry tirades. It was a well-known fact that Tish had run away many times to escape them both. Colleen guessed that Tish was drawn to Vicky because she exuded a power and strength of character that her mother lacked. Colleen sighed. Tish was so misguided, but there was nothing to be done about it. You can't change people, and people don't change, thought Colleen. C'est la vie, c'est la guerre. A loud thump on her study table made her jump almost out of her chair. Colleen looked up to see Kirk fighting back laughter. The squeak of his book cart should have warned her of his approach, but she had been too deep in thought to hear it. <laughs> Sorry, he chuckled insincerely. I hope you didn't wet yourself. As was her frequent habit, Colleen blushed. Kirk, stop that! She cried as loudly as she felt she could get away with in the library. Quickly, she scanned the area around her to see if anyone had noticed. No one seemed to be staring at her. Ah, don't worry. You could scream and no one would care. As soon as he said that, Kirk's smile left his face. Sitting quickly, he pushed aside the stack of books he had dropped on the table. Well, not no one. A strange, serious mood had suddenly come over him. He lowered his voice and looked deep into her eyes. Look, I was wondering, would you want to meet me at Wide Awake later for coffee or something? Or something? Colleen said suspiciously, trying to be funny. But her quip only embarrassed Kirk. Or steamed milk or something, 
he stammered defensively. I just want to go out with you, just us. Colleen let out the heaviest sigh of the day. Since history class, she had forgotten her suspicion that Kirk had a crush on her again. She barely had the energy to reply gracefully, but she tried. I'm going out with Lance tonight, Kirk. Anger flared in Kirk's round face. He started to say something, then closed his mouth without a word. We, we go through the same routine every time, Kirk said. I've got it memorized. I'm not your type. We're best friends, Kirk. Colleen hung her head for a moment. She wished there were something more she could say that would calm him down. But nothing came to her. Nothing ever did. To be honest, I don't know what I need. I obviously like you, but I like Lance. Heck, you were the one who introduced us. Colleen immediately regretted saying that. Stung by the reminder, Kirk stood quickly, shaking the table and nearly knocking his chair backwards. Thanks, I needed that. Colleen stood. Kirk, please. She began, but was cut off when suddenly a gnarled hand gripped Kirk firmly by the shoulder. It was his turn to jump. Mr. Newman, are you finished with that cart of books I asked you to put away? The person who now had Kirk in her clutches was Mrs. Waddell, the head librarian. She was as old as the building itself, it was said, and she smelled at least as musty. Kirk turned to face her. Sorry, Miss Waddell. His anger disappeared in an instant. A surprise appearance by Mrs. Waddell often had a sobering effect on people. I I'll get right to them. He started for the car, but Mrs. Waddell held him in place. Her mouth widened in a disconcerting smile. As was her habit, Mrs. Waddell launched into a lecture for the benefit of both of them. If books are away from the shelves, Mr. Newman, it means our patrons cannot find them. And if books cannot be found, then they cannot be read. And an unread book is the saddest type of orphan. Mrs. Waddell's bright eyes quickly darted around to see who else might have absorbed this most valuable bit of freely dispensed wisdom. Satisfied at least that Colleen had heard, she released Kirk from her claw and hobbled away. Kirk stood still until Mrs. Waddell had disappeared into her office. At first, neither spoke, but as soon as the door closed, Kirk went first. Yikes! Kirk's eyes were wide with mock fear. Colleen grinned, suppressing a laugh. She didn't like to make fun of Mrs. Waddell. Certainly, the woman was growing more and more dotty, and her proclamations more absurd. But the woman's advanced age should be rewarded with respect, not ridicule. Normally, Kirk had plenty of pointed remarks to make about Mrs. Waddell, but this time he turned silently to the cart and started to will it away. I gotta put the uh, kids to bed. Colleen knew the pain of her rejection had returned. Kirk. He turned and looked once more at her. Sadness was set in the lines of his face. Traces of anger remained in the corners of his eyes. He shrugged. Hey, no big deal. Another battle lost, I guess. The cart squeaked as Kirk willed it away. Colleen shuddered. Kirk's response to her was different this time. Normally, he'd apologize and sulk for a few days. Then he'd forgive her and return to his nervous, desperately hip self pretending that nothing had occurred between them. Maybe the fact that she was interested in someone else this time changed things. Or maybe the fact that the other person was his cousin Lance and that he was responsible for their meeting made it even worse. Would he not speak to her now or would he be mean to her? She hoped it wouldn't be the latter. Abuse from Vicky she could take, but from a friend as close as Kirk? Now that would really hurt. She'd just have to wait and see. Colleen turned back to her research materials for her report on Joan of Arc. It was becoming increasingly difficult to concentrate, but she had to try. Going through her pile of resources, she soon realized that one book from her reading list was missing. At a nearby database terminal, Colleen typed in the author of the book she was seeking, Milo Gabrev, then pressed enter on the keyboard. The screen blanked out for a few seconds except for a character in the middle representing a clock. Then the title of the book appeared in green phosphor letters. Jotting down the reference number, she took the information to Mrs. Waddell, who had emerged from her office and now sat at the librarian's desk. Excuse me? Colleen handed her the slip of paper with the reference number. Can you help me find this book? 
I'm sure I can, replied Mrs. Waddell, bestowing upon Colleen an almost beatific smile before looking at the number. She always had a smile for a library patron who needed help. She took her role at the library very seriously and, as a result, had a deep appreciation for anyone who used the library and showed an interest in books. She felt this especially with students. So many kids had been lost to video games and television that she felt it her duty to make their visit to the library a positive experience. As the location of the book came to Mrs. Waddell, her eyebrows lowered slightly, but the smile never wavered. This book is found in our reference section in the library basement. I'm afraid I can't show you exactly where it is since the stairs are steep and my bones have trouble with the four steps up to the front door of this library. <laughs> Mrs. Waddell chuckled unselfconsciously. That's okay, Colleen said. I'm sure I can find it. I can get someone else to help you if you'd like. Your friend Kirk, for example. Then the old lady smiled knowingly. He's a nice boy, but he gets distracted easily. If he helps you, you won't let him get distracted again, will you? She winked good-naturedly. Colleen knew what the librarian was thinking. Oh, Kirk and I aren't, she stammered, choking back ironic laughter. She looked away from the old woman's moist eyes. Kirk and I are just friends. Is that so? Mrs. Waldell asked slightly, misinterpreting Colleen's reaction as embarrassment. Back in my day, when a boy sat that close to a girl, they were sweet on one another. Then she turned wistful. Of course, kids today, there are a lot of things they'll do together today, even if they don't like each other. She sighed, and there was a moment of silence. Now it was Mrs. Waddell who seemed embarrassed. I'm sorry, young lady. You know how it is with us old folks. Don't have a lot of people to talk to, so when we see a good listener like you seem to be, we take advantage. The only other person who listens is Denny, and of course he doesn't have much to say. <laughs> she chuckled once more. So would you like someone to help you find the book? No thanks, I'll be okay on my own. Okay then, feel free to come back if you need any more help. Colleen thanked her, and Mrs. Waddell went back to the paperwork on her desk. Leaving her other books at the table, Colleen walked across the library to the stairway leading to the basement. On the way, she passed Kirk with his nearly empty cart. He simply raised an eyebrow at her. Colleen froze, not knowing what to expect from him. Then Kirk smiled and gave her a smoldering James Dean look, with a wink for added effect. Colleen felt immediately relieved. He wasn't angry with her after all. Better still, he hadn't lapsed into his usual sulking either. She returned his wink with a smile and descended into the basement. The smile disappeared about three steps down. Four more steps and the gloom of the library basement enveloped Colleen completely. The exchange with Mrs. Waddell had distracted her from the fact that the library basement was her least favorite place in the building to go, and she wasn't alone in that regard. The basement gave everyone the creeps. She stood at the bottom of the steps. A small hallway led from the bottom of the stairs to the basement's main section. The smell alone almost caused her to flee back up the stairs. Mildew old paper. Not as delicate as it was upstairs. What's more, it reminded her of the nightmare. Swallowing the lump of irrational fear that rose in her throat, she walked forward. Old card files lined the walls. They were being saved because of their value as antiques. The deeper into the basement she walked, the more oppressive the air became. Several small rectangular windows near the ceiling of the basement were closed and provided little light and no ventilation. Mahogany bookcases filled the entire space, except for a clearing in the center, which contained a study table. No one ever studied down here. No one could, even if he or she felt the inclination. Bare, incandescent bulbs shone from fixtures similar to those of the floor above. These, however, were not as elegant nor as well-maintained. The light was dim and yellow and could not reach around between most of the bookcases. Even on the brightest of days, entering a row was like walking into a dark alley at night. Looking at the numbered cards at the end of the first two bookcases, Colleen realized with some distress that her destination was toward the back of the basement. She nervously glanced down each row as she passed it. 
Each seemed like a musty tunnel with a sickly light at the end. As she continued, she walked faster, realizing that the sooner she found her book, the sooner she would be able to return upstairs. As she had feared, her book was located on the bookshelf against the wall farthest from the stairs. Before she walked down the row, she glanced over her shoulder, suddenly sure that someone was behind her, but no one was there. Then she looked down the row another tunnel. Daylight shining through the tiny window on the wall above did little to lessen the claustrophobic effect. The dark leather book covers seemed to absorb light. Cramming down the ball of fear that threatened to rise once more, she purposefully strode down the aisle, stopping where she thought her book might be. She was close. The reference numbers and titles were hard to read in the gloom, so the activity distracted her from her fears. It was not long before she found the book she had been looking for. It turned out to be a heavy, leather-bound volume with gold stamp lettering on the spine. Colleen pulled it from the shelf slowly, so as not to disturb the books around it. Just then, she heard a noise from behind. Her fear returned threefold. Gasping, she turned quickly. A shadow passed by in the next aisle of books. At the same time, the book she had been holding on to fell to the ground with a loud thump. This startled her, spinning her back around. Before she could react, books that had been next to her fell out of the bookcase in mass. In the otherwise silent basement, each book sounded like a bomb when it hit the floor. Frantically, Colleen reached up and stopped the rain of books. The basement became silent again. Colleen was tempted to flee the basement, leaving her book behind. Instead, she closed her eyes and breathed deeply for a few seconds. She needed the, her book and it was unlike her to leave a mess for someone else to clean up. She stooped down to organize the books that had fallen. Her focus on the task was so intense that she did not notice a figure emerge from the shadows and glide silently toward her. Once the books were stacked neatly, Colleen picked up as many as she could. As she stood, two scarred hands reached for the remaining books. The hideous pink and white flesh stood out against the dark, drab book covers. With a yelp of fear, Colleen fell backwards, dropping her armload of books. Above her towered a ghastly figure wearing a dark jumpsuit. A thin ray of light from the window struck its face. It was the face of the torchbearer in her dream, and he was reaching a monstrous hand toward her, the scar tissue almost glowing in the dark. Chapter 4 Scrambling backward like a crab, Colleen tried to escape the grotesque creature reaching for her. She kicked out, and her foot connected with something solid. With a yelp like an injured dog, the specter withdrew his hands, rubbing the one that had been kicked, and began to retreat into the shadows. Colleen suddenly realized where she was, the basement of the library, not some nightmarish town square where she was about to be burned as a witch. She closed her eyes and in a moment willed away the smothering fear and called after the creature, who was rounding the corner at the far end of the aisle. Denny, wait! The figure hesitated, then disappeared out of sight. Colleen got to her feet. I'm sorry, she pleaded, as if speaking to a small child. I wasn't paying attention. You startled me, that's all. It's okay. You can come over here. Only a slight whimpering suggested that he remained just around the corner. Then, as silently as he had appeared before, Denny returned. The dim light again revealed his scarred, monstrous features. But Colleen successfully suppressed the urge to wince in disgust, knowing that he had little use for pity, either. Colleen forced herself to just relax. Whew! She laughed. I was totally zoned. Didn't even see you there. With a casual shrug, she stooped to pick up the books that were now scattered widely over the floor. Denny, who had stopped several feet away, moved toward her again and silently began to help gather them. Colleen looked up and smiled at Denny. As soon as she did, he averted his eyes. Denny was the Springwood equivalent of the village idiot. Mute since birth, he had been dismissed long ago as retarded. Natural parents might not have accepted that label, but... 
Denny had no real parents of whom anyone was aware. Shuffled around from foster home to foster home, he had received only the most rudimentary education. Very early on, an apathetic social worker had deemed him capable of only the most menial labor, so he had been taught to sweep and mop and, occasionally, hammer a nail. Those small skills might have allowed Denny a reasonable existence, but then there were the hideous scars that covered much of his body. According to the whispers among the adults, a drunk and sadistic foster father had punished Denny for some minor offense with a bath of battery acid. Despite the cruelty involved, the man responsible had gotten off lightly. After all, Denny was only a feeb. His appearance ruined, Denny achieved monster status in Springwood. Parents would actually use him in place of the boogeyman in bedtime stories. As a result, he was feared by young children and taunted by the older ones. Only Mrs. Waddell had treated Denny like a human being, offering him a job as a custodian at the library. At first, the so-called city fathers had protested, saying that he would scare away the children. It was hard enough to get them in the library these days. Finally, Mrs. Waddell shamed them into a compromise that allowed the library to hire Denny, with the promise that he would keep mostly out of sight during business hours. Unwittingly, this only furthered Denny's reputation, for he became the rarely glimpsed fiend who lurked in the library basement. Not long ago, Colleen had been among the fearful. She had never openly teased Denny, but she dreaded the sight of him. Then once, she had observed him hard at work, unaware of her presence. At first, she had been repulsed by his appearance, but something about him made her keep watching. That's when she realized how natural and relaxed his movements were, how confident he was of his abilities. He was fixing a bookcase at the time, and just how normal he appeared. Not like a monster, but like a person. Before she realized it, she was walking toward him to get a better view and gave herself away. The instant Denny looked up, the moment was ruined. He retreated immediately, fear replacing the glow of satisfaction in his eyes. She had called out for him to wait, but he didn't even look back. Colleen felt ashamed. At first she thought it was because she had spied on Denny in a private moment, but it was more than that. By his reaction, he had been anticipating mockery or disgust. It had happened to him all his life, so why should this moment be any different? He was a monster because people refused to see anything but a monster, and so he was instantly defensive and skittish around normal people. No wonder he acted in ways that reinforced the perception of those who persecuted him. That moment had convinced Colleen that Denny deserved better, so she would do better. This encounter had been her first opportunity since then, and she had blown it badly so far. On the other hand, the fact he had come forward in the first place was unusual for him. Perhaps he had sensed her intentions after all. As they replaced the last of the fallen books onto the shelf, Colleen tucked the one she had come down for under one arm and extended her other hand toward Denny. Thank you, Denny. I'm a klutz. She was smiling at him brightly and naturally. Denny looked nervously from her hand to her face. Colleen was beginning to think he wasn't so frightening after all. Don't worry, she told him. I don't think either of us bite. A smile seemed to form on what was left of Denny's misshapen lips. Then, slowly, he reached forward to grab her hand. Colleen braced herself, hoping that Denny wouldn't notice. She had never touched him before, and she didn't know how the scar tissue would feel. Then her hand was engulfed by his, and they shook. Actually, she thought his skin felt kind of smooth. Denny stared at their clasped hands, seemingly amazed. Suddenly, fear blazed in his eyes once more, and he pulled away. With one last frightened glance, he ran off, soon disappearing in the shadows. If he had stopped around the corner again, Colleen could not tell. The basement became oppressively silent once more. Rather than push her luck, Colleen decided against calling Denny back. That's enough excitement for one day, she thought, for both of us. She caught not even a glimpse of Denny as she walked through the basement on her way back to the staircase.
Even though the main floor of the library was brighter and more cheerful than the basement, Colleen was still unable to concentrate. Stacking up her books of Joan of Arc, she decided to take them home. Perhaps she'd be more comfortable there. Lance was manning the book checkout. Kirk's cousin was tall and thin, but not awkward. He saw her and smiled, the power of which bored a hole in her uneasiness. No wonder Kirk was jealous. Not long ago, it had been unthinkable that someone as handsome as Lance would be interested in her. Not only that, he was older, 18 to her 16 years, and in college. Their relationship was still very new, but she felt it was a very special one, and she thought he felt the same way. With a wink, Lance turned his attention back to his next customer, Tish. Do you have your card with you? He asked brightly. Tish swallowed nervously as she set her books on the counter. Uh, no, I don't, but... That's okay. Just give me your name. Lance interjected. Tish Hughes? After a few taps on the computer keyboard, a beep was heard. Lance ran his finger down the display on the screen. When he finally stopped, he asked Tish, On Elm Street, right? Tish nodded. Using a light pen, Lance scanned the barcode on the inside cover of the book. The computer beeped, then twice more. Lance frowned. I'm sorry, but the computer shows you have $2 in late fees. I can't check out any books for you until you get that cleared up. Lance seemed truly sorry for the inconvenience. But I don't have it on me right now. A note of desperation crept into Tish's voice. She rarely had much money on her and was ashamed of the fact. And I, I have this report due for school. I could hold the books for you if you like. Lance told her pleasantly. But if I come home without these books, my parents will think I blew off the library today. I told them I was coming here. My father will be very angry if he thinks I lied. Tish was on the verge of tears. Couldn't you make an exception? I'll bring the money in tomorrow, I swear. Lance considered it for only a moment, and like the gentleman that he was, started scanning the rest of Tish's books. He slyly blinked both eyes at her and told her he thought that would be okay. And then he smiled at Tish, and for a moment, Colleen felt a twinge of jealousy. The feeling passed when she realized Lance was doing what came naturally to him, being an awesomely nice guy. Thank you, sniffed Tish. Unfortunately, her relief lasted only about a second. Excuse me, young lady, but all we can do is hold your books for you. Mrs. Waddell had appeared and towered over Tish from behind the counter. Lance immediately froze. But like I said, Tish protested, I can't go home without my books. I can't. Well, if you had brought your previous books back in a timely manner, you would now be able to check those out in a timely manner. Mrs. Waddell crossed her arms and glowered at Tish, who burst into tears and fled the library. Colleen's eyes were locked on Mrs. Waddell as she turned her gaze on Lance. Instantly, her expression softened. Put those books aside for when the girl comes back. Lance nodded quickly and began to gather the books. I appreciate your sense of chivalry, Mr. Matthews, Mrs. Waddell continued, but a certain sense of responsibility must be instilled in these young people. Then she stopped, waiting for a reply from Lance. Yes, ma'am. He answered dutifully. Mrs. Waddell's expectant look melted into a satisfied smile. She started to turn away when the front door to the library banged open. Tish had returned, urged forward by Vicky and Melina. Both Tish and Vicky had red faces. Tish from embarrassment and Vicky from rage. Go ahead, Vicky ordered Tish, and then pushed her toward the counter. Mrs. Waddell's eyebrows went up in bemusement. May I? Tish asked Colleen in a pathetically small voice. Colleen nodded, allowing Tish to walk in front of her in line. She held up two dollars to Lance. My friends loaned me the money. Can I get my books now? Lance looked from Tish to Mrs. Waddell. And your library card? asked Miss Waddell scornfully. Tish burst into deep sobs once more. Fuming, Vicky approached the counter. She told your boy here she don't have it, you old witch. Vicky's regular speaking voice seemed like shouting in the library. Other customers were starting to look. It got stolen along with her driver's license and some other things when she was here a few weeks ago. 
probably your mongoloid pervert janitor did it. Young lady, Mrs. Waddell was indignant. I'll not have you speak of my employees in that manner. Leave here at once. Oh, why don't you just drop dead, lady? Vicky spat back at her. Mrs. Waddell blinked as if she had been slapped. Tish don't need the card, and you know it. Or are you going to make her fail her class? I would do no such thing. Fiercely, Miss Waddell turned to Lance, who obeyed instantly. Give this girl her books. Then she leaned forward on the counter toward Vicky. You, young lady, and I use the term quite insincerely, need to show some respect. Until you do, you are banned from entering this library. If I see you, I will have Denny throw you off the premises. Vicky shrugged off the threat. I got the books I needed earlier today. Guess I won't be able to return them now, huh? By now, a shell-shocked Tish had rejoined her friends. Can we please just leave now? She whispered shakily. Sure, let's go. With the sneer, Vicky turned and the group began to leave. At the door, she turned back toward the counter. And don't think I didn't see you there, Kalini Weenie. I'll definitely catch you later. Lance, always a pleasure. Then, with the sexy purse of her lips, she said, Woof! To Miss Waddell, she smiled harshly. And as for you, have a nice heart attack, you old biddy. The three were gone a moment later. Tough as she was, the encounter left Mrs. Waddell a bit flustered. If you see any of them, especially that sharp-tongued girl, I want to know about it. Is that understood? Yes, ma'am. Lance told her promptly. Still agitated, Mrs. Waddell went to her office. She closed the door behind her with a restrained but unmistakable slam. Kirk rushed up to the counter just as Lance began to check out Colleen's books. Clash of the Titans. I've never seen Miss Waddell that upset. I guess she has a pulse after all. <laughs> Kirk chuckled to himself. Colleen batted him on the shoulder with the book. Kirk, what if she hears you? Don't you think she's put up with enough already? Colleen's right, cuz. Cut the woman some slack, okay? The glee left Kirk's face. You guys are no fun, was all he could say, and he went back to work nearby. After Kirk left, Lance gave Colleen a special smile. I'm off at 9 p.m., beautiful. We still on for dinner and whatever. Colleen giggled. What is it with you and your cousin and your whatevers and somethings? Lance didn't have the slightest clue what she was talking about. Never mind, she answered his curious look. I'm sure whatever with you will be fun. Great, I'll pick you up around 9.15, 9.30. See you there. She blew a quick kiss to him, wrapped her arms around her stack of books, and left the library. Whistling as she walked, Colleen had forgotten all about her earlier experience in the basement, and she was totally unaware of being watched as she got into her mother's car and drove home. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters three and four of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror Twice Burned by David Bergantino. First off, I want to say thank you to uh, one of our Slasher Icon patron tiers. That's the $50 tier on the Patreon page, Jeremy Wilson. Uh, thank you for voicing Lance in tonight's upload. And thank you to PMDG. Uh, that is a friend of... Uh, Jeremy's, who uh, helped him edit all the recorded lines uh, to make my editing job of putting him into the upload a lot easier. So thank you, uh, PMDG, and uh, thank you, Jeremy, not only for voicing Lance, but for supporting the channel at such an amazing tier on the Patreon page. It means a lot. Uh, so yeah, chapters three and four tonight, guys. We got some more character development. We got to meet a few more of our players here in the story, and I gotta say... <laughs> Uh, the Mean Girls, wow. Uh, Tish and Vicky, and I don't know if it's Melina or Melina. Uh, I hope I'm saying it right uh, when I do say it. Uh, and I hope I'm consistent and I don't accidentally say it both ways. 
uh, wow, just snotty characters. I think we, we've we all known people like that, especially back in high school. I don't know what's up with Kirk. Uh, he's acting like he's cool with it this time, that she's not interested, but at the same time, I think he's holding on to some resentment there. And he's one of my suspects. And I've got one other suspect, and it's not Denny. Uh, although Denny seems like, you know, that, that would be like people's first pick because he's burnt up. He's a mute, so he can't hear his voice, so if Freddy was, like, possessing him, it would be easy for Freddy to get around, but I don't think it's him. Um, the person I think it is, and, and bear with me for a second here, and David, please don't laugh too hard if I'm completely off base here, I think it's the librarian, and the reason I'm saying this is because of her mood swings. Um, she went from, like, really kind of hateful at one point to just really nice and, and vice versa. And it's like she can just go from one emotion to the other. Or maybe that's just the way I'm reading her. Uh, but yeah, for some reason, I'm now suspecting uh, Kirk and the librarian if somebody's possessed in this book by Freddy. Uh, I could be completely wrong. I probably am. Maybe I just have a thing with old semi-mean librarians uh, that I think they're evil inside, but for some reason I just feel like this librarian might be the one. I'm gonna, you know, I do not, I, I will never read ahead in these books. I'll be surprised just like you guys will. Every chapter is brand new for me, and uh, you know, we'll all find out together, but I am gonna tell, I am gonna say my suspects, so very first suspects are um, Kirk and the librarian. I'm leaning more towards Kirk but I think it could be uh, Mrs. Uh, I think it could be the librarian. Uh, anyways, um, it was cool to get a little character development with Lance again. Jeremy Wilson, thank you for voicing him. Um, I don't see him as a suspect mostly because I haven't got to see a lot from him yet. He just genuinely seems like a nice guy. The character. Uh, the thing is, this book may not have as many, you know, tense scenes or or uh, questionable things happening like Virtual Terror did early on. But I am enjoying the character development, and I'm curious to see where it goes. And I have a feeling when the bodies start dropping, things are going to really pick up. And I feel like this whole witch-burning dream is going to play a part in that. And I think that Denny has some kind of psychic powers, and whenever he touched hands uh, with her in the basement, that uh, he saw that she's like a reincarnation of a witch, or he's seeing her dreams or sees that perhaps she has some evil in her. I don't know what it is, but I feel like Denny saw or felt something, and I feel like that's going to get fleshed out more as we go forward. So there's not a whole lot to talk about right now, but I'm uh, I'm rearing to get back into this. I'll be back in a couple days with more of Twice Burned. I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you are too. And until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying, thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, pleasant dreams! And uh, we'll see you next time. I'm also not really feeling that great today. I hope it didn't affect my narration too much, feeling a little under the weather. Uh, Going to take tomorrow off, but like I said, I will be back in a couple days with the next installment. See you then.